Okay. Um, good evening to everybody and thank you very much for joining us. Um, I'm so delighted to see so many of you here to hear Jenny Gay speak, given her long relationship with this society. Jennifer is a landscape architect, gardener and writer based in Greece. She grew up on a farm in Wiltshire in southern England and spent her childhood immersed in farming life and the natural world. She studied ecology and geography at undergraduate level, followed by a master's in landscape design at the University of Sheffield in the UK. While working for a year in an architectural practice, however, she missed the outdoors so much that she applied to the RHS Rosemore to train in horticulture. Armed with her joint qualifications, she then put all of it into practice in three years at the Jerusalem Botanical Garden and back in Europe, a year and a half at the society's very own Sparosa Garden outside Athens. Jennifer set up her own design company in 2004. Working predominantly in Greece, she specializes in the creation of climate adapted, naturalistic landscapes, natural habitats and gardens. With 25 years design and gardening experience in the Mediterranean basin, she has developed a deep intuitive knowledge of growing plants in summer dry climates. Drawing on this and a lifelong love of plants and wild places, sense of place and planting composition is integral to her work. Her aim, she says, is to create beautiful spaces where people feel part of and uplifted by the natural world. This evening, she will discuss five projects in different areas of Greece, her approach to creating the landscapes that are climate appropriate and increasingly moving towards low input gardening for more sustainable results. Thank you, Jenny, so much for that agreeing to talk to us. It's been a long wait because we actually agreed this last November, I think, but I'm so we pleased did. to see you tonight. If you'd like to share your screen now. Can you all see that? Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Brilliant. Sorry okay. Okay. Well, thank you, Angela, for that lovely introduction. And thank you all for, for registering. It's just, it's really um, thrilling that so many of you want to hear this. Um, so yeah, Angela's given a good introduction to, to me. Um, and we're going to look at um, some projects and how I've managed them with climate and environment in mind. Um, as we all know, the MGS was founded with the principles of water, water wise gardening at its heart. And, and climate adapted gardening is, 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 is really an extension of that. And I think probably most of us are, are really trying to practice that. Um, and I think these considerations are important wherever we're gardening, but maybe particularly, whoops, we're going too fast, um, particularly with, with the Mediterranean, because we do experience um, a harshness with our long dry summers. Um, and, and, and with climate change, um, of climate events becoming increasingly unpredictable. So as Angela said, I grew up on a farm and I think it's had a profound influence um, on, on my life choices because I spent a lot of time playing in these fields and, and in streams and, and in the woods. Um, and, and even though I tried to work in an, uh, full time in an office for a while, it, it, it didn't last very long. <clears throat> in 1997, I came to the Mediterranean um, first in, in uh, Jerusalem um which you know a lot of israel has a, a mediterranean climate and and shares um habitat types in common so that really introduced me to the mediterranean climate and the mediterranean flora and i really fell in love with it i spent three years there and then started to try and find a position in um, a mediterranean garden or some kind of landscape practice in europe in in mediterranean europe and that's how i ended up coming to Sparosa. By this time, it was the year 2000, and I was Sally's first um, garden assistant. So until that time, she'd managed alone. Um, there she is. Um, I, I, I want to pay tribute to her because it, um, it was quite an extraordinary pri privilege spending that year and a half gardening with her. Um, and, and, and she really is the original sustainable environmentally friendly gardener you know she 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 always recycled everything um and she i i saw this um 
in my local organic shop. And I took a photo of it for this lecture because I just thought it sums up um, how Sally viewed life, you know, us being part of a whole system and 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 and, and, and respecting all, all other living creatures rather than thinking we're going to dominate it. As many of you will know, she was legendary for her ability to spot um, the tiniest, the tiniest plants at a hundred paces and, and more. And this photo was taken by Claire Avery, one of her later assistants, um, probably two years before she died. So she would have been 88 in this photo and she's scrambling up this very precarious, rocky um, cliff on Mount Mitos, sort of holding onto a telegraph pole. And, and, and if you look very closely, <laughs> there's a cigarette in her left hand. <laughs> It just sums up her courageousness and her uh, enthusiasm for life. Um, so um, here we have Greece and um, the climate classification types. And when I was researching for this talk, I was reminded that there's actually two, two um, uh, med main Mediterranean climate types in, in, in the Mediterranean basin. The, the one with the hot summer and the one with the warm summer. Now the very bright yellow is the hot summer. And then these sort of slightly more gray patches in the middle are the warm summer. In Greece, we've got mostly the hot summer. And let's just go to the next slide. I see a lot of the Mediterranean basin does have this very bright yellow, which is, which is termed as the hot one. Um, but then as you go inland in some of the er other areas, you get into cooler climates. Obviously, the red on the bottom, it represents much hotter climates that are going towards desert. And then I got further into this. I, I hope you can see this. It's not the best images, but there's two um, images that show how the climate was classified in 2016 and what they're ha expecting to happen in the year 2100. That's how you, yeah, so you can see, obviously, it's getting hotter. Um, and at the moment, quite a lot of, yeah, oh, sorry, we're on the wrong one. Um, in 2016, there's quite a lot of yellow still. And then as you go into 2100, we're starting to get areas of desert in Spain. Um, the yellow is creeping up into the north of Italy. Um, the cool area, mountainous areas in, in Greece are disappearing. So this is what is expected to come our way. And I think just generally, we all know there's gonna be more unpredictability. So my practice, um, I'm Cyclades based now. I used to live on the mainland, but now I, I live in Andros, um, but I, I do projects all over Greece. Um, and I guide them through from the drawing board to their physical creation. And then we also offer aftercare um, for the maintenance. And in some of those gardens, that's ongoing and has been for many, many years. <clears throat> um, landscape design is quite noticeable as a discipline, whereby once you've done your, created your garden and, and, and finished your planting, that the process doesn't really end there. Um, so what happens thereafter, the maintenance, um, it, it, it is it, it controls how the garden looks and so it's crucially important and often rather undervalued <clears throat> i feel the, so these are the the design and maintenance values um that i try to put at the heart of the practice um sense of place that means and by that i mean reading and respecting the landscape and and then trying to allow it to inform what we do climate adapted which is uh, uh, the theme of the, the talk and I mean, in, in the main point being that um, trying to grow plants that will cope with the conditions that we're living with rather than trying to impose plants that can't cope. Um, enriching biodiversity, even though in Greece we're living in the most um, rich biodiverse country in Europe, there's still plenty of um, areas where there's been destruction and there's always room to improve biodiversity, I think. Sustainability trying to minimize input and, and, and doing our best to use resources sustainably. And then hopefully all of those things mean the result is aesthetically pleasing. So I'm just, I've got this rather long list of what I mean by climate adapted gardening. Um, <clears throat> and I've got some slides to illustrate all these points. So um, I, I won't spend ages going through these here, but I'll illustrate them with, with, with slides. <clears throat> 
So the first thing um, is to use plants that are grown from the outset to survive drought and heat. This is taken at Olivier Philippi's nursery. And <clears throat> he really, he's the holy grail for, 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 for dry gardening in, in the Mediterranean basin, really. Um, so he's been going out and collecting plant material from the driest areas of the Mediterranean for probably over 35 years. This is one of his slides, I think, taken in Morocco. So if you're collecting plant material from areas like that, you can be pretty sure that, that that's that's tough. Um, the next thing is to encourage deep rooting when you're planting so that the plants can be independent and survive without lots of molly cuddling. Um, the chap on the right, um, sorry, on the left is Ariane, who's been with me for 15 years. Um, dig your holes big. <laughs> That's a very big hole for a, for a, for a, for a mature olive tree, actually. Um, it's important if if you buy the plants from Philippi, he you know, I think many of us already know about his special pots that encourage the roots to go down, and right from the outset he's he's encouraging the plants to grow um, to be tough. So he's not overwatering them or overfeeding them. But if you don't have plants from his nursery, then you might need to break spiraling root balls at the time of planting to stop them continuously going around in a circle and never breaking into the ground. <clears throat> Water catchment basins um, for the all important first year watering. Some clients don't like the look of the moonscape it creates, but it doesn't last for long. And it's so worth it to be able to give the, the plants a deep water and infrequently. So if you don't have those big basins, then you can't give deep watering unless you're standing there with a hose for a couple of hours. <clears throat> right plant, right place. <clears throat> Sometimes for me, um, that means needing to recommend um, plants that come from landscapes like this. This is Ceros in the Cyclades, um, photo taken in August. And I remember when I first, even when I came to Greece, I'd already been in the Mediterranean for three years, um, but I still looked at that landscape and and sort of felt um, a regret that it wasn't flowering or looking fresher or waiting for the time when it would be. And my approach has completely changed. My perception has completely changed. So now I look at that and I see beauty and all the different colors of gold and bronze and even greys um, that come about as a result of, of, of su summer survival techniques. So that's... Um, a close-up of the same landscape taken a little bit later on and on a duller day. And you can see there's total defoliation on many of these plants um, where th and to, to help them survive in these rocky, dry conditions with no rain. But still, there's a beauty in it. And, and I think a lot of um, uh, encouraging my clients to, to go with dry gardening is about getting them to embrace more this summer dry aesthetic, that there is there is actually beauty in it. Um, and, 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 and explaining why plants uh, behave as they do in the summer in the wild. I think it helps us um, embrace and enjoy them more somehow. So I just put up a few plants here. I think many of us are really familiar with this already, but the summer dormant spiny cushions, um, sarcopateri like sarcopaterium, um, oils and, and aromatics, resinous oils and aromatics produced by plants like thyme um, ha have an effect, uh, a resistant effect against radiation as well as making them unpalatable. The lovely felty leaves of so many Mediterranean plants. This one is origanum um, and beautiful contrast in a, in a planting composition. Oops, sorry. And then also the dimorphic foliage of some plants like Flomis, which um, drop their leaves in um, late spring, early summer to the, the wide flat leaves that are good for photosynthesizing. And they drop those and replace them with a narrower leaf that's held vertically that helps them reduce their water loss. Um, Maki community shrubs. For others of you in different areas, you'll be familiar with this um, in, as, as, as chaparral, matarral, finbos, malay in Australia. Um, they're just amazing for structural um, frameworks in the garden. This is a completely natural area that's being 
possibly, probably, actually, uh, in Greece, goat grazed. And the wind and the environment just makes those shapes. Um, and I use these plants again and again in my in my designs because they're just so good and strong and tough. And any if they're not flowering, um, they're just that the foliage gives such a lot. And many of them do flower and bury at different times of the year as well. And then on a lower level, the other really important community, whoops, um, in in Greece is the uh, the Fregina, um, also known as Garig, which is this, going back to this lovely community of aromatics and prickly subshrubs and bulbs and grasses in there. And, and those often give us the fantastic spring um, floral displays. And there's a few of them that I just use again and again and again because they're so useful. <clears throat> So here we have a garden um, <clears throat> that I would say is a high input garden. Um, I'm not sure where it is actually, but um, you do still get demand for gardens like this in Greece. There is still um, an idea that this, this is how a garden should look. Um, so this will be watered frequently, probably every day. Um, <clears throat> there'll be lots of nutrients going in there. There's lots of colorful annuals. Um, because of all the water, there'll be lots of lush growth and um, then probably lots of chemicals to control the pests that like the lush growth. So there's there's a lot, a lot of resources going into that garden, um, even though it, it might be colourful and green, but it doesn't really belong to the Greek landscape. Um, so this garden... Um, is what I would call a low input garden. It it doesn't have fertilizers or nutrients added to the soil. Um, yes, we added sand into the the planting holes um, in order to create good drainage. So that is a a resource used, and we've also gravel mulched it. Um, but they're mostly one off um, inputs that then help the garden be more sustainable and use minimal water. Um, so this garden is watered perhaps once a month and, and even and less than that now. <clears throat> so another point in our climate adapted gardening is to respect the water cycle. Um, this is water logging from runoff from um, from paving um, that, that from torrential rain, but the water just didn't have anywhere to go. It's very rocky soil underneath. But if you use permeable paving and, la and rain can, can permeate where it lands, then it does help to reduce this kind of thing. Reducing compaction in heavy soil. Pre soil preparation is super important to make sure you have good drainage. Um, here we're adding um, sand to clay. And yes, that is a lawn in the back <laughs> ground. It's the only garden that we've done with a lawn. Generally, we don't do lawns. Um, the client really wanted something um, that, that that where his children could play. And, and it's watered about every four days. Um, okay. So And there we have, um, this is permeable paving. So it's not on a concrete reinforced base, which um, is very popular to do here. People are quite afraid of earthquakes. And so they tend to do paving on, on this reinforced concrete base always, but it's, it's, it's not always, it's not really necessary in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a wild area, in a rural area like this, where you can lay your paving slabs onto a soft earth base or sand base and allow, and, and even, and it, okay, you have paving slabs, but the water, the rainwater can, can permeate through. And that was also an example of of using locally resourced materials. That stone came from from the place. Um, reduce, recycle, reuse, repair everything you can. The 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 optimum the, the the classic example in the garden is is composting. So wherever you can to to compost material. <clears throat> um, managing fire for landscape. Oh, sorry, managing landscape for fires. Um, this fire came up to close to my home this year. My house is on the ridge at the top, the white house with the fire coming right up behind it. This was about six weeks ago. Um, 
and um and there was a little bit of burning in in my in my garden but luckily um all was well um generally we we're, we're told that fires are bigger than usual in the last years with increase in, increased and in more intense heat and possibly there are more of them and most fires are um started by humans but this one in fact was a lightning strike we had a, a, a continuous storm without rain of dry lightning and these were there were two strikes that started the fire in two places in the valley we also had fire in Corfu um, again it was about um, this area had burnt 15 years ago um, and this year this time it was about 40% bigger than usual which apparently has been the average because the the, the flammable material was that much drier these are olives. Um, I went close to inspect them and, and they are actually alive. And I'm hoping next time I'm there, I will see that these are greening up because that's exactly what happened with this pistachia terebinthus. This is just down the hill from my house and you'll see part of it on the right side is singed. A, a month ago, the whole of that crown was singed and it has, with we had a decent rain and it's re-sprouted green from the top, which is really exciting. Um, some other plants I noticed that were recovering really quickly after rain were Cessacilloquastrum on the left there, and then Drimia shooting out days after fire, and that's in a completely um, scarred, um, fire scarred landscape. And of course, the oaks are really good at, at recovery after fire as well. So well, let's get to the projects. Um, here we are back in Greece. Um, I have projects all over Greece. I tend to have a hot spot in. Corfu, um, I'm sure partly because the conditions are quite good for gardening there. And then, so we're looking at two projects there, one project on the mainland where the rainfall is much less, one on my island of Andros, and then another one over near Turkey in the east of Greece. Just to remind us about rainfall, the dark purpley color is the highest rainfall, over a thousand millimeters. Um, Corfu up the top here, where we're going to look at two projects, often gets 1,200 millimetres of rain, which is twice that of London. But the big difference is in Corfu, it falls on 50 to 60 days of the year. And in London, half the rain, but it falls on 250 days of the year. So steady rain throughout the year, whereas here, a very intense, fast rain. The project we're looking at in Attica is, oops, sorry, um, uh, less than 400 millimetres of rain a year. The orange areas are some of the lowest rainfall. Then the, the Andros, where I am, I'm in the, one of the wettest uh, Cyclades. We have about 600 a year. And then uh, Samos over in the east um, is about 800. So here is Corfu, typical um, view of the landscape there. Um, cypresses, olives, rocky, mountainous, very beautiful <clears throat> island that has become very um, touristy. They have huge numbers of visitors. <clears throat> it's got very high humidity, which is both good and bad for gardening. Um, bad in the sense that um, it we tend to get many more pests there and it seems to be getting worse and good in that it just gives the gardens a little bit more of, of, of support um, through the year. So the first one we're gonna look at is Rue, which is right up in the Northeast, close to Albania. Um, and there's lots of tall mountains up in Albania with um, that send down rain and quite cold winds in the winter. We can get snow. I've been snowed in up at Rue on more than one occasion. So it's quite a contrast because in summer we might get 38, 39 degrees. And then in winter we might get minus five. Not every year, but it happens. This is Rue. Um, it's a hamlet. It's about 500 meters above sea level. Um, it was home to uh, stonemasons and the whole area is full of quarry quarries with excellent building stone. And these um, families came from Ipirus on the mainland, apparently around 200 years ago, because there was a lot of building and they built their own houses from the quarries on which which were right beneath their feet. <clears throat> 
it's very floristically rich. This is a typical roadside verge in um, spring, um, amazing diversity. <clears throat> and this was the kind of feel I got when I first went to Roo. Extraordinary views across to Albania, um, ever-changing and ever-beautiful. And that view is quite important in consideration when you're landscaping because you don't want to um, steal its thunder, I suppose. Um, and it's important not to block that view, frame it, um, and take it into consideration um, um, in, 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 in what you do. So this is Rue as it was, um, and this was the big inspiration for the planting palette. Those natural colors you can see on the right side, wisteria that dated from um, when the village was inhabited. Um, with caving in roofs, wildflowers just storming all over, um, and shrubs, fig trees growing out of walls. I mean, it was quite an extraordinary, magical place. It was abandoned about 50 years ago um, because it didn't, oops, going on its own without me, um, because um, there was no electricity there and no running water. And when running water came to the nearest village, they up sticks and, and went to, to, to live um, to where, where they had those modern conveniences. Um, so it hadn't been lived in for about 50 years and an architect uh, named Dominic Skinner um, stumbled across it and found out that it was for sale and he bought the whole thing. And um, he didn't really know what he was going to do with it, but he knew he wanted to restore it. And a plan came to restore uh, the houses for uh, luxury holiday rentals, which is it's what, what, how it, how, what it's doing today. <clears throat> so this is um, Lunari Annua, which uh, is is um, all over North Corfu and, and very much too in 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 Rue. <clears throat> this is the wonderful stone. Um, you can see the striation, the horizontal striations. It makes it a brilliant uh, building stone. This now is the backdrop to a pool. Um, I haven't got a picture of the pool in the in the um, presentation, um, but it makes an, a wonderful backdrop um, to 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 the communal pool for Ovru. <clears throat> and we used, of course, this building stone um, in in the project. Um, and almost everything came from from the place. So it was very much making use of what you had locally. A lot of our work at Rue was about pruning and sculpting what was there. So it wasn't just restoring the buildings, it was also, also restoring the landscape. So there was lots of impenetrable growth, um, uh, overgrown trees, damaged, broken um, thickets that you just couldn't walk through. And so I think 60%, if not more, of our work there was about pruning, sculpting, creating the spaces um, which would make which would make the landscape. <clears throat> Almost all the plants that we used are Mediterranean natives. The hillside at the in the background of this photo is a natural hillside and, and makes beautiful part of the view. And, and 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 the planting we wanted to try and reach out to that to to bring that landscape in and 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 try and reflect back one from the other <clears throat> so you see all these wonderful contrasting maki and frigana type um plants here um most of them in this photo are not flowering by now and um but they still i think make a lovely composition hopefully <laughs> Um, and this is again at a later time of year. Again, you see the hillside beyond with the olive groves mixed in with maki and cypresses. And um, in the foreground, that's a um, planting of atroplex, which we've cloud pruned um, to kind of reflect that hillside opposite. We have to manage vis visitor expectations also. Rue is full pretty much all of the summer with um, guests, paying guests. Um, so it was important that we had um, flower flowering interest in the summer. Um, this is the main walkway. And um, this photo has was taken by Clive Nichols, the garden photographer, and it's been quite a lot on social media. Sorry, everybody keeps doing that. Um, and so this is the start of the flowering season, the wisteria walkway 
way. And then um, we carry on through with underplanting of agapanthus and plumbago is in there somewhere. You perhaps can't see it. So in the summer, we need to rely on um, flowering plants from other Medi Mediterranean areas um, to help us. So, of course, the South Africans and the Californian flowering plants are pretty good in helping us do this. We do need to water them to keep them flowering but um, they give us flowers that maybe our own local flora doesn't give us. So the Agapanthus of Plumbago, brilliant at that. And then um, the Tilbagia, it goes from April to November. Um, and if you keep deadheading it, um, yeah, on, on and on. So that's, that's a really useful one for our summer color. Um, here is um, a little a little shot to show you what goes on behind the scenes. This is in January. We're pruning the wisteria. Um, Isabel Sanders on the left, who was one of Sally's assistants, and Lola, who works for me full time in Corfu, is on the right. Um, and so a lot, lot of care goes into to getting it right so that we can keep that floral display going. And then another shot to show how the the picture changes throughout the year. You know, the gardens change um, over the years, but also consistently through the year. And I think each each stage has its own beauty, even though it's not quite the showstopper that it is when it's in flower, it still has interest. So this is going down into the lower part of Rue. Um, that tree is a pistachio terebinthus. I think it's the biggest one I've ever seen. And it's literally growing out of a rock. Um, quite extraordinary. It was in pretty good shape when we found it and we have pruned it um, to create this area where you could walk through. Um, lots of spring flora in this area, but there wasn't so much to carry it through onwards. Um, and I tried planting Acanthus mollus, thinking it might uh, survive through the summer. But in fact, even if we water it, it, it doesn't really want to keep going. So we let it follow it, its natural cycle. And we keep a succession of um, irises follow through. That's a little bit later, early June. That's Iris Jane Phillips. Whoops, it's doing it again. Um, so that's the same area with, um, and then when the irises die down, we just accept that it's going to be a dry area um, with the framework of the the shrubs and the trees around and the rocks and 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 it's really enough. It's quiet, um, but it's a, it's it's enough and it's a, a little bit like the, th the threshing floor at Sparosa. Um, Okay, and then going on down into the wilder areas, we increasingly planted um, only natives. Um, this area is um, was quite an interesting spot because we started digging. We saw that the soil was really stony um, and we started digging to see uh, what our planting depth was like. And we started to discover all kinds of um, things like shoes and um, Second World War um helmets army helmets um no plastic there was no plastic but it had clearly been the village dumping ground um and we had to take out about 10 ton of material from this area before we could plant and bear in mind that everything in rue um there's no no road going through rue so there's a uh, parking at the top parking at the bottom and then about a hundred steps in between up this quite steep slope and everything that we did in Rue had to be carried in by bucket. So um, that was quite an adventure. And then continuing on, you see again the, the stonework, um, <clears throat> the little ruin at the background. Um, the architect very cleverly made that into a, a kind of folly lookout um, which is rather sweet, rather than than restoring the whole thing. Okay, so that that that's Rue, and now we're going down to the west coast of Corfu. Um, still good rainfall. Um, it's closer to uh, uh, sea level where we are there, um, and we have the west coast views. Generally, I find west coast um, west coast gardening much harder west western facing gardens more difficult because you have that 
beating sun the whole afternoon. Um, and, and, and so the, there is a little bit of added stress with a west facing garden. Um, again, it was a very beautiful landscape. Um, it's an area of um, olive groves interspersed with quite a big stretch of unspoilt um, maquis, which I, I really hope that um, not too many houses get built there because I fear that they may. Um, <clears throat> but these extraordinary olive trees, which um, many of you will be familiar with in Corfu, with all this rainfall, they grow twice the size of the ones in, in Attica and many other areas of Greece. Um, they have been neglected, though, and many have damaged or broken um, branches and are quite fragile. So our role here was to try to keep the stature and size of these beautiful trees, because they really are significant, but to try and make them a bit stronger. And generally, what happens with this kind of size olive tree is that they get cut off at the top of the trunk and then left to re-sprout. So you lose all that amazing crown. Um, and we really spent a lot of time trying to, to make sure that that didn't happen. Um, we use tree climbers to get up into the canopies and, and it takes about four, four or five hours to prune every one. So it's, it's an investment, but I, I think it's, it's really worth it. So the house is very modern. Um, by a Paris-based um, Greek architect uh, called um, Emmanuel Hupis. Um, and we worked very closely together to um, figure out how we would try and anchor this house into the landscape. And even though we have these very strong contemporary lines, um, they all feed back into the original terrace terraces of the plot. So the plot was all, all, all an, an abandoned olive grove. Um, recycling, reusing what, what's there. We we took um, stone from the excavation and broke it down and, and made it in, into walls. So all the all the stone came from came from the site. Um, a big area of planting in front of the house. This is on the pool terrace looking up. Um, <clears throat> this um, slope was quite a, a, a subject of debate. Um, because I wanted it to be in two terraces to make the planting easier. It's, it's a 45 degree angle slope, um, but the client and the architect won the day and they wanted this big, quite dramatic slope, um, which you look down on from the house terrace and look up and, 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 and the house kind of disappears really into it. And the planting is um, basically um, a weave of native shrubs, grasses, perennials, um, and there's three mixes in there and they're all repeated five times. So it's kind of quite, I'd say quite Pete Oldoff inspired. Um, and in this photo, I think it's year two, all the grasses and the perennials are going crazy and the shrubs have not yet really um, developed. So the, the shrubs um, are, are going to come up and really sort of hold it together. And we we clip them and, and that's, that's, that's gonna anchor this whole whole scheme. So at the moment it's, 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 it's very exuberant, but there will be a little more structure in there as time goes by. And that's it from the side angle. Um, <clears throat> so the aim of the planting I mean, obviously, to provide interest, and um, and 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 the clients were really committed to an exciting um, garden, um, but to soften the architecture and and to make it feel it belongs of the place. Um, and this was the the image from the the front of the the talk. So obviously the. The garden is changing all the time. I used um, Santrantha's ruba. Perhaps um, I was a bit bold because it's really seeding itself all over the place. And unexpectedly, I've, I've used Santrantha's in other projects in Greece and never really had a problem with it rampaging. And here, with more humidity, it is rampaging, even on a water cycle. We, we're watering here about every 16 days um, during the summer and trying to decrease that year by year. But even then, it's still going crazy. So we have to manage the centranthus all the time. In the background, you see the olives that we've pruned um, um, and, and, and they're coming back really well. And, and, and some of the fragile branches are actually thickening. And there's one of the S-shaped olives. And, and again, at a later time of the year, 
um, less color, but lots of contrasts. <clears throat> Um, this house has a roof um, garden. So this was part of the effort to blend it into the landscape. And the local planners really liked it. And I think in, in it's a contemporary structure. A lot of the Corfu new builds are quite traditional in appearance. And this one is not. And I think the green roof really helped to get that through through planning. Um, and they commended that that effort. Um, the green roof is um, ha plays a role in moderating internal temperatures, so it, it's not just to be pretty. Um, <clears throat> this part of the green roof in the background has a depth of around 50 centimetre substrate and we can grow um, shrubs and it blends right back into the landscape behind it. So it just merges, merges imperceptibly. I, I don't have a photograph that shows it to you, but 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 it does. Um, and then the main part of the the house, the the living space, the living room um, has a shallower green roof. It's a huge expanse. It's I think eight meters by fifteen, um, and that's a shallow green roof um, with about twelve centimeters of substrate um, and succulents and hipparinia. The hipparinia are actually taken out um, because the client didn't like them. <laughs> um, so we have a low level planting there. What I didn't anticipate with this green roof was that this part of it especially is a sitting duck for weeds. And we spend a lot of time and effort weeding. Um, so the substrate, um, there's lots of perlite in there and um, tufa and crushed brick, um, a little a little soil. Um, but it's it's just this wonderful flat space that weeds just seem to love. So we're still we're now in year three, I think, and we're still weeding almost every month um, to keep that under control. <clears throat> and that's I, I I guess really because it it's in a in a in a relatively wild place um, where there's just hundreds and hundreds of of wild plants waiting waiting to land there with every passing bird or 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 wind. So that that's Corfu. Um, moving on to the mainland, we're into area of a uh, very low rainfall, less than four hundred uh, mil a year. Um, this garden is just down the road from Sparosa, so it's in very similar conditions. It's slightly higher um, above sea level, um, and there, there, there's there's a photo of typical Attica. This is taken just near near that project. So you, you can see very rocky, dry landscapes, relatively treeless. Um, <clears throat> and there is the house. The house was built many years ago and um, I was we were invited to come in and plan a garden when the house had already been there probably probably 20 years. So you can see it's surrounded by Mackey olive groves. Uh, a little bit of pine behind, um, so it has um, quite a ha hodgepodge of, of 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 landscapes around it. It's an area where there has been quite a lot of um, development, both um, housing and light industry. Not not directly near the house, but but in the whole area of Attica. Um, <clears throat> so it's a large plot around. Um, 25 stremata, which is around eight acres. And um, this is how it was when we took the project on. So there were trees, um, lots of olives, very beautiful olives, very dry, rocky soil, um, lots of parent rock pretty close underneath that surface and the odd shrub planted here and there. So we really needed to find a way to unify the site um, to make it feel more harmonious, to make the house feel more anchored in its landscape, um, and to sort of add another dimension, because it felt quite two-dimensional. So this was um, three months after planting. We've put irrigation in because we, we have so much planting here that it was the best way to deliver that deep, infrequent watering. Whoops, sorry, I've done it again. Um, so yeah, that's that's just three months in, and then that's one year later. So it was quite fast development, and some plants really go quickly in 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 Greece, and then you have to wait for the structural plants to come through. 
Again, we've used gravel as a mulch to um, you know, retain the moisture. <clears throat> And this is uh, five years after planting. I think this is a photo taken by Olivier Philippi and um, he came to visit us here. And he said, it, it's like an agroforestry landscape and, and he's right. So we've added this, this, this third layer and it becomes typical of, of the agroforestry landscapes around in, in Attica. And the spaces have become more immersive and enjoyable. Um, and we created pathways around the garden where you could walk through and, and really enjoy the plants. And again, it's this old favorite palette of Bupleurums, Atroplex, Pistachias, Ramnus, all these plants that um, give this fantastic um, structure and, 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 and a multi canopy, of course, which is good for biodiversity. And again, um, the idea that you change from, from 2D to 3D. And then we we have some really good flowering plants with um, plants like Salvia, Alan Chickering, Peroskia is fantastic. A Leucophila, another one from, from Texas is amazing for giving summer flowers with little water, little or no water. We phased the planting so that we didn't put too much stress on the well. I forgot to say that there is a well in this garden, though it often dries up in summer. Um, so we needed to be careful and we did this um, planting over um, several years. And this was a priority, it's right near the house and, um, and needed to be, it was one of the first off the blocks along with the boundary planting that I showed you just now. And this is um, the after, um, there it is with a sculptural goat and there with one of my doggies. <clears throat> we use um, succulents quite a lot to give some drama, Dazillerions, agave, attenuata, yuccas, there's one appearing over there. They're all really fabulous for giving you a little bit of dynamic um, dynamism in, 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 the, in the planting along with the flowers. And again, you've got the tilbagia there, which is just irreplaceable. Uh, and Gaura, though, Gower in the driest gardens often doesn't make it through the summer in, in Greece. Um, gravel mulch again. Um, this was the last area of the garden that we planted. And I think it was the area where, where I, I feel I got into my stride the most. I think it's the area that I'm most pleased with. And it probably has the most diversity of plants there. So it was again, olive grove, um, quite compacted soil that we really broke up to get the good drainage. Um, added the gravel mulch. And in case you're wondering why there's a, a Jeep parked up there, this used to be um, used to haul things around the garden and it broke down in that spot. And um, we thought rather than move it, we would just treat it as, a, as, a, as an artistic installation. So it stays there. And in fact, plants are growing out of its engine now. And this is a very recent photo of that area. So that's probably five years in. Um, Lomalosia in the foreground, brilliant for ongoing flowers. They dry, but they're just lovely and sort of frothy on, um, on, 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 on that shrub. <clears throat> and then the Peroskia um, with the Lomalosia in, in the foreground. <clears throat> Again, both really, really useful. Um, uh, this is a um, photo of Vilka, the owner of the garden, um, with her dog, Boo Boo. And um, so I just wanted to talk about Apex predator, predator. We think of ourselves sometimes as gardeners, as Apex Predators. Um, so, um, and the Apex Predator really dictates how, how the planting community evolves. And, and and Vilka is is the best apex predator in in the sense of managing the wild plants that seed, and from both our planted plants and also from the wild community. Um, so this is a big issue for us in um, that, of course, seeding plants are the future of the garden, and gravel is really good for helping the plants to seed. So all any garden that we have that is graveled has a really great seedling population with all these wonderful plants emerging. 
And um, sometimes we have problems in some of the gardens where someone goes in very enthusiastically and removes them. And so we have to try and teach them to, um, to, to choose the right seedlings to remove. Um, and, and Vilka is, is a genius at, at doing this and also allowing just wild plants that have decided they want to be there and, and choosing whether they're the right ones that can live happily with the planting that, that we've put in. <clears throat> so here we are um, on our way to Andros. Um, <clears throat> the garden we're going to look at is about 300 metres above sea level on a west facing garden. Um, it's, it's, I think the main thing to say climatically about this garden is that it's windy. In fact, the whole island is windy. We're very famous for our wind here. Um, <clears throat> but we have good rain and, and Andros has springs. So we're, we, we have that advantage. Um, and we have these wonderful valleys. We have four of these valleys in, in Andros that go northeast to southwest all one after the other in a rolling direction. Um, and this is the highest uh, point on the island, which is around just under a thousand meters. And then in the foreground, you have um, a typical wall, which shows the, the, the rock, which is a very sort of skisty rock. Um, and it gives rise to this very moisture attentive um, soil, surprisingly. I was quite surprised at how moisture attentive it was, mineral rich, nutrient poor, um, quite moisture attentive, um, but generally pretty free draining. And, and we have very, very good results with Olivier Philippi's plants here. Um, I zoomed on again. Yeah, so <clears throat> this is a very typical of um, the northern part of Andros, um, which is a little bit like the moors of Scotland, but but with sun, a, a, a lot of sun. And along the top, you see the typ typical vernacular of, of, of the walls of Andros, which have these rather particular um, large stones placed in them, which was, which was a lab labor-saving device, but they're rather beautiful. Um, <clears throat> and then and Andros also has um, very rich, fertile, well-watered valleys. So it's, it's quite a comparison. This is just above my house. Um, and you see these beautiful windblown multi-stem trees, um, heavy goat grazing, and we have very a lot of sarcopaterium dominance because they don't touch that. Um, but it's still a, a, a rather beautiful landscape. <clears throat> this is the project. Um, it's in a village called Apravato, which means without sheep. Um, it's definitely with sheep and goats so we needed to fence it we're always reluctant to fence but um they just come in and, and make a lot of destruction and, and it's just not just the eating of the young plants but also um you know these uncontrolled goat herds um do a lot of damage to walls um so yeah, a fence went up. Um, in the background, you see a a Acer Montbelliensis, which is a beautiful maple um, local to, the, to, 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 to this island. In fact, it's growing in many areas of Greece. <clears throat> um, and a um, beautiful site. Um, and it had these um, wonderful terraces. And these are beehives. And sometimes in Andros and many of the Cyclades actually, you see these beehives built into the walls. And of course, we've kept those. Um, this is um, a, a monument to the to the goat. Um, my client commissioned uh, this beautiful sculpture of a goat, which is just perfect, <clears throat> eating a, a, um, a Kermes oak there. <clears throat> and you see this rock, um, which is part of the, the garden um, and, a, 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 a really important part of the, the structure of the garden. <clears throat> so we used our usual palette of, of plants, um, the greys and the greens. Um, Bupleurum in flower here. I don't think we've had a slide where it's been in flower and, and that's another one with the shrubby whorehand, which we find really, really useful for summer flowering and also Sorry, um, the the limey green color is are also a really useful contrast that we don't always get. We get it with euphorbias in the spring, but that one that starts to flower 
late June, early July, and, and then goes on all through the summer. And again, the, the flowers dry and are very beautiful um, part of the garden. <clears throat> so these, these clients fully embraced um, the concept of dry gardening. It was another garden that was pretty much supplied by by the Philippine nursery. And you see here, um, this is the, um, the side um, entrance into the, the up to the back, back part of the house. And you see the, um, the Santaria spinosa has defoliated, but I think it really looks um, perfectly fine, you know, when it's contrasted with plants like um, uh, Cistus and regani and pistachia and flomis which are, have kept their foliage um but you know some people might look at that in a plant brochure and think oh goodness i don't want that plant with any leaves but actually when you see it in the composition i i think it looks rather beautiful and there it is again in another part of the garden just as, with the evening light picking up the bronzy colors but mixed in there with globularia um regani again <clears throat> Tucreums, Asalvias, Helichrysum. <clears throat> and that's looking out to um, the west, looking up towards the mainland. <clears throat> and you, you, there's a windmill there in the in the foreground, which is rather a, a lovely focal point. And again, like the Rue project, we really tried to reach out to the landscape beyond, just to sort of bring it in. And that's um, a photo taken a little bit um, later in the season. And there you see the helichrysum with the um, the ongoing flowers. I think it's known as immortal in in French um, because it 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 just keeps going and going. And again, the tulbagia. And you see, oops, the local stone um, again from a local quarry <clears throat> to help the house feel anchored in the place. <clears throat> and there again we have Lom um Peroskia and uh Limoniastrum. I almost forgot its name. And 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 there again very useful and in very low low water conditions. And this garden is in is on um a two to three week water cycle as well. And that's looking back up towards the house with the big oak behind. And you see the helichrysums and the lomelosias there and mixed with all these other lovely frigana types. And and and, and gaura. It's just about enough gaura, um, water to keep the gaura going. Um, in some gardens where we have no water, um, the gaura, the gaura doesn't make it. <clears throat> and that's with the evening light again. Um, we we leave the 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 flowering heads on flomis um when the plants are established in the early years we tend to remove the 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 dead the, the dying flowers because it seems to keep the foliage a little bit stronger through the summer okay we're nearly there um this is the last garden um samos near turkey um I've put it in because it's a town garden. It has a little higher rainfall, so it, ha it has um, wind, um, but it's 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 a little bit kinder than the last two gardens we looked at in terms of climate. Um, and here we have an incredibly deep soil. When they dug the excavations for the house, they they never found bedrock. It just went down and down and down. Um, so it's probably you know it it it's sort of it it it's in a valley leading to the sea, and it's it's all this soil that's washed down from the mountains over the years. So this is Samos, a little bit like Corfu, um, slightly drier, less tree cover, but there is still significant tree cover. Um, lots of pines. <clears throat> this was the site. Um, it really was a bit like Grand Zero. Um, just about everything had been demolished. Um, there was a citrus orchard left, um, which was not in a great state, but we've revived it. And there was also a beautiful um, walnut orchard, which we've managed to use. I'll show you how in a minute. Um, so take a look at that white house on the on the horizon. The next photo, you can just see it on the left side. So that's the same view five years later. So it's um, oops, it's a two. Two acre plot, nine strometer site, just, just over two acres, um, right in the heart of a university town um, called Karlovasi. Um, it was an industrial town that was famous for um, uh, having lots of tanneries. 
Um, and um, quite unusual to find this large uh, stretch of land in the middle of 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 this town. And, and there had been a small house there that was had been totally abandoned, but it was in such a bad state of repair. Um, it, it was demolished. Um, but the, the, as I say, there, had, there were fruit trees here, but in this part of the garden, I really have no idea what had been there, probably orchards of some kind. Um, but so we created this sort of multi-layered planting again. Um, <clears throat> there's a public car park on the right side of the garden. Um, so it, it's quite noisy and we had to um, try and create a, a screening um, to buffer out noise and um, also for a visual screening. <clears throat> and again, the same kind of mix of uh, multi layers of, of Maki Frigana plants. Um, oops, <laughs> sorry, it keeps happening. Um, <clears throat> and we clip the forms to make these cloudy, cloudy forms um, and to give the, 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 the strong framework. Um, the garden is quite long and thin, and we created these meandering paths all the way through, which then also created large flowy areas of planting. Um, it's quite an interesting garden in that um, when I began conversations with the client, um, he said he had, didn't, hadn't had a garden before, and it was quite a new idea to him to, to think about actually walking through his garden rather than it being something that he viewed from afar. And so he's he really enjoys this idea of how immersive it is um, walking through and getting that experience. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> again, the, the idea of bringing bringing the uh, surrounding landscape in, um, in this case, a church. <clears throat> there is the church with all the all, all, all the planting, um, <clears throat> and. I like to think of this garden as a wildlife corridor um, because we've created quite a stretch of, of, of habitat actually there, um, which links, it's almost like a linking point with other gardens and then to the hillsides, hillsides beyond. Um, this is the walnut orchard, which we managed to um, make into the main entrance. It was very convenient that it happened to be that there was a lovely, um, straight walkway um, that we could create to a place that that was accessible to the to the the road, and we underplanted it with plumbago and um, myrtle and phytosporum, and there's a rigeron in there and agapanthus um, at certain times of the year. And there again, we it, the garden really needed shade, as you saw in the first um slide there was really nothing there so um, we created a mulberry avenue here and then further down the garden there's a grove of melia um asderac the persian lilac um we 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 added sand into the soil mix because it was quite a hay, heavy heavy soil and also you saw um again in that first picture how um, all the construction traffic was going straight over it and, and heavily compacting the soil. So we had to do a lot of deep digging. Um, and this again, just shows all the layering. Um, we use tree, sorry, trees like carobs and um, ficus and oaks and pines to create the shade. <clears throat> Leucophila um, from Texas. Um, I just wanted to show one of that um, fantastic as a as a summer late summer flower. <clears throat> um, and then yeah, a, a little word about so we 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 prune um, we trim regularly um, many of the plants to to reduce uh, vapotranspiration rates and you know to, to so, so that when they're going into summer they they don't they don't have growth that can wilt if it's if if, if it's in a very drought stressed area and um, this always reminds me the gardener we have a full time gardener here he's a really really good really good guy but he sometimes loves to over prune and I have to restrain him to to kind of allow the plants to to breathe and express themselves a little um, but he does maintain it beautifully other than that um, so we're coming to the end. Um, um, so many books and people have influenced me. I've just put up a few um, books um, that are particularly relevant to this talk, 
while I I um, make my conclusion. Um, so I guess my first point is that it makes total sense. I think we all we all agree um, to look to the native flora um, for our inspiration. Um, that's what's surviving in this climate, and and um, we're really trying to convince our clients to embrace the summer status of of our Mediterranean plants. Um, um, so that I think this is key to really uh, enjoying um, rather than lamenting how they look, if you really appreciate what the plants are doing and how they're behaving. But always bearing in mind that you can use other Mediterranean climate plants for those summer flowers. And succulents, um, so incredibly useful for, for structure and accent planting. Um, <clears throat> as Europe gets warmer, um, I think gardens in in Northern Europe are looking to us for um, techniques. And, and I would really like to see more skilled gardeners out there in, in Greece, at least, um, promoting dry gardening techniques. Um, we're quite short on skilled gardeners. There's a lot of people working out there with little training and, and, and lots of really good landscape designers, but few um, really skilled gardeners um, working in an artistic way it tends to be quite technical gardening um and just to finish if i've got time um food for thought um last year i went to um, one of the beth chateau symposiums um of the theme of which was um rewilding the mind and lots of interesting ideas, a group of 500 gardeners and designers all gathered together, and it was a really um, interesting event. The two things stood out for me. Um, one was the talk by Fergus Garrett, who is head gardener at Dixter in Sussex in the UK, um, very well-loved garden of the late Christopher Lloyd. Um, and they'd recently had a biodiversity audit carried out in the garden. And the belief was that the greatest biodiversity would be in the meadows. And in fact, they found that the greatest biodiversity was in the oldest part of the garden where there were lots of um, old stone walls and paths. Um, but this is a, a, an intensively gardened area. And that's where the greatest biodiversity was. And then the second point is that um, a guy called Dave Goulson, who wrote the book Silent Earth and the left hand bottom corner of the screen, um, he told us that in the UK, gardens take up more space than protected uh, nature reserves. Which means that, um, that we as gardeners, uh, what we do matters. Because if 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 I, I don't know what the figures are for the, the the Greece or the Mediterranean, but in the UK, if there's more garden space and nature reserves, then then what we do can really change things. So that's it. That's what I have. Thank you, Jenny. Fantastic. I mean, I think that it's so brave of you to take on the um you know the 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 maintenance after you've planted i think that's that that makes you sort of a, a, a unique um because of course we all know that the, on the paper it's it's one thing but actually doing the walking the talk shall we say so if, yeah it, if, it's if, rewarding it is rewarding carrying a garden through it can be it, it's it's quite sometimes quite difficult to juggle designing and and managing gardens because often you know I want to be out there doing what the plants are telling me they need and I've got clients who are also have design deadlines so it, it's sometimes a difficult juggling thing but I, I I really enjoy it so can I ask you now to um, stop sharing so that we can get everyone back um okay hi everybody um I noticed that that, that the chat has been extremely active and I um would like uh, to ask Maggie um, just to quickly read out any questions from that were on the chat um, for Jenny uh, so that you can just answer that. So shall you go for that, Meg Maggie? Yep, sure, let's go well, with that. that. Um, so there's quite a lot of questions, some of them quite specific and some of them more general. Um, one question is about how widely are the native plants available for horticulture? Presumably the question means um, native plants to Greece. Are getting more widely available all the time. 
all the time, uh, much, much better than when I started. Um, I think the difference is that few people are um, yet growing them in a way that really prepares them for drought. And mm. that's that's the big, big difference. So I can't, I, I find that with Olivier, I, I mean, I, I think maybe I skipped through this. When I buy from Olivier, Philippi, we have much better chance of getting those gardens to get off irrigation. Um, I think we do. I mean, I'm so, I, you know, I hear in France that there's a massive dry gardening culture and many clients are asking for dry gardens. I don't think anyone's asked me for a dry garden yet. I'm the one who's trying to convince them they need a dry garden. Um, so, uh, yeah. So, but I think, and, 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 and the Greek nursery trade is still, it's young. And um, they're still a little fearful and they're still, you know, when I go to the nursery guys here and I say, can we grow plants like this? And I show them a Philippi plant and they go, no, no, buy that. You know, they want big plants with a little pot, not 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 a pot with a little little bit of plant. Mm. So we've got we've got a way to go here. Mm. That sort of leads into another question, which is how would you advise getting your gardening team on board with water wise principles? So how do you persuade the people who garden your gardens to uh, engage with? <laughs> I have that problem. I mean, my own team, we're, they're, they're, I mean, I don't think they join my team unless they are dedicated. So, you know, my, my <laughs> team are there and, the, and I, and I work and you know, I collaborate with other gardeners and, you know, we work together and we're all of a mindset. Uh, my problem, I, I share that problem in that, you know, some of the gardens have an, uh, have a, a, a local gardener. You know, we, we tend, I don't think I explained, we tend to do quarterly visits three to four times a year to do the kind of the structural works and, and pruning, trimming um, and so on. And, and often with some of these bigger gardens, they've got a local guy and some of them, it's really, really hard. Um, I think the, the more you can explain why it's important, the better it is. Um, yeah, it depends how much they're willing to take it on board. Sure. I don't know what kind of people, um, I, I, yeah, I mean, it, some of it depends on education. But there's a question here about also, are there any um, recommendable schools or programs for gardeners training in Greece? Well, that's what I want the Mediterranean Garden Society to do. <laughs> and they are doing it. Lucy is already doing stuff I and mean, she's doing so much now and also on social media. But I think that is something that that our society has the potential to do. Um, I, do you know, I, I can't answer you really um, comprehensively because I don't know how much is being taught in in colleges and schools and, and, and universities now. I know Lucy does get school groups um, and possibly students also at Sparrows. We've certainly had students historically. Mm. Um, and there's people interested, but I think that there's still isolation. I certainly feel quite isolated sometimes. And, I, you know, sometimes I feel mm. like I'm the only one, only only one out here who's really trying to, to do this. But I mean, I, I think lots of people are trying, but there's still a lot of fear here. Sure. Um, how are the gardens watered? How? How? Most of the gardens that we make that are watered have an, in fact, all of them have an irrigation system if, if they're going to be watered. But we do, we insist on deep, um, infrequent watering. So we're trying to make sure that that's never more than once a week. Um, <clears throat> I mean, now, you know, everyone who comes to me, um, uh, except and they know the style of gardening that I do so I don't get, get into the situation where someone really wants a very lush green garden um, but sometimes eyebrows are raised by collaborators if I'm trying to water even once a week they, they mm -hmm. there's still a mindset that you should be watering every day mm -hmm. um, but I'm trying um, with Philippi plants we normally start off on a 16 or uh, 15 or 21 day cycle and then just keep getting less and less and less until um, some of them have no water at all some of them we still water once a year um, sorry, once a month because um, they just get a bit too tired for the client you know it was something we try and push it and push it and push it and then there'll be a point why I say, okay, we'll just do a water. So the irrigation systems sit there under the gravel and are used when they need 
to, to, to be used when they're needed to be. And it might seem like an extravagance, but with big gardens, it's it's cheaper than having someone water. And the other problem is if with some, if you have someone water, you have to trust them to do the deep watering. And that's very hard, unsupervised, if they're not totally engaged in dry gardening. Um, another question, what do you do with leaf litter in the gravel mulched gardens and how deep is the gravel layer? Gravel layer, um, it's about, um, it's, look, it depends on budget, but we aim for 10. Um, really like to do 10, if not more. Sometimes we have to accept around seven and a half. We try no less than seven and a half, and that's that, that will only be a budget constraint. Um, and the leaves, um, soft tine rake, um, they're a little bit frustrating, but I think you you learn to a lot of people are very afraid of that. And I think you learn to it, 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 the gravel becomes just like the soil and you just rake a bit. Okay. The thing I love most about gravel in some ways is that it stops people leaf blowing because I get um, some of these guys out, out in the, out in the uh, on the islands leaf blow soil, which drives me insane. Sure. Um, <laughs> there's an interesting comment here. Um, uh, somebody obviously in California who who talks about there's a contrast between your using gravel mulch in Greece, whereas they use a woody mulch in California because yeah. they find the gravel desiccates the garden plants too much. Really? So That's that about a difference in rainfall. Um, that was no, no. Um, so I would say um, so using we use mulch um that's been you know garden waste that's gone through the shredder i i think i should have mentioned this um and, and 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 shredded to create a compost we use that as a mulch in the bigger shrubby areas so i'm talking about maki plants will accept that perfectly well and that that's lovely but the smaller um frigana plants especially the silvery ones um, I think that kind of organic mulch, it, it tends to create this humidity around their necks and then might cause um, phytophthora problems. So I do tend to avoid it for that reason. But I, 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 I haven't had that experience that that person's getting in California. OK, here's a very specific question. Do you have any suggestions for trees in the northern part of Greece near Katarini? The garden faces east and near the sea, and they would like some shade in the summer. Can we? Can that person? Can I be in direct contact and and have a think about that? Um, yeah, that um, is Petros's iPhone. That question came from. <laughs> okay, Petros's iPhone. If I can um, <laughs> link up with you after. Um, I don't know. Um, it would be okay. good. To just You'll be on the registration that. list. Uh, Yes, people have asked of also if uh, they could have a if, plant list. If I could jump in, um, maybe oh. I could send. Uh, sorry, this is uh, this Katarina is not is just Petros is uh, is wrong. It's a mistake. <laughs> All right, uh, if, you I'm sorry write about to me, that. if you write to me, then I will. I will write to you. Okay, well done. Um, okay, okay so the you. plant list, Jenny. Do you think? Plant list, um, so what um, of a particular garden or just of, any of and the... many. Of the plants that you're using in the gardens, because it oh, seems yeah. that I mean, my, sort of yeah, palette I can, that you were using. Yeah, yeah, I can and give I, you my faves, uh, my favourite one. one. Yeah, Jenny, one of our uh, uh, speakers earlier in the year did something that I thought was quite useful. He he did his sort of, you know, tops. You, we don't expect you to sit and write thousands of plant names down. I mean, obviously, um, but he sort of he had his top thirty or something like that. Um, yeah happily happily yeah. because i think there were a few i kept saying i use these yeah. again and again and yeah sure absolutely 100 percent. and i think it was not there it was nice that there were so many there were different stories in your you know different layers mm. in, the, mm. in the in the plantings mm. so, um, so if that comes to me then i can distribute it to the the attendees okay um, okay brilliant another, thank you another question is how often are you pruning the shrubs Oh, that's a really good question. Um, it depends a lot on the year, actually. I mean, it depends on the rainfall um, and it depends on the level of watering that we're giving. I and mean, the less less you're watering, the less you're pruning, which is great. <laughs> um, so in the driest gardens, you know, it can be twice a year. In some of the gardens where we have this balance to strike between um, client needs and trying to be dry gardening, and uh, it can be four times a year. 
and it depends on the shrubs as well it, it, it so that's quite a complex question yeah Sorry. fair enough, fair <laughs> enough. <laughs> um, thinking about diet biodiversity have any of your projects had baseline biological surveys that you then oh. follow up to document change i'd love to do that no yeah. um I mean, they did that at Dixter, which I mentioned, and and, and it was fascinating. I think they they it was absolutely fascinating, but no, I mean, I I I remember one project we did in the Peloponnese, and that was a project which had been raised to the ground. I think there had been quite interesting frigana before we even arrived, and um, the the builders went in and just took everything out, and I remember we we camped there for three days to to kind of measure up and you know, get a feel for what we were going to do. And and we saw nothing living in that place at all. Mm. And, you know, when we started planting and butterflies started coming in and birds were nesting, it was just so the best thing. It was one of the most rewarding moments ever. So yeah, I'd like to, I would definitely like to do that. Um, there's a comment here about amending garden soil, saying that in California they're urged not to plant into they're urged to plant into native soils and not break up the soils because that um, destroys the soil structure. Yeah, and I totally more agree. Compaction, so. Yeah. I totally agree. Um, it depends on the, the the situation that you are landed with. So, for example, in the Apravato project, um, there was a lot of undisturbed terraces with native soil. Fantastic, and that's all we had to do: just plant into it. If you're if you're planting on a building site that's had machinery going over it, um, it's a nightmare. So you've got to do something. But I totally agree. Where we can, I'm to, I'm into um, the no dig and non non amendment. And 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 in fact, maybe I didn't highlight enough that I am going more and more and more towards less um, less um, additives. I and I went through a phase of using sand integrated into the soil. Not in fact, I'm interested to try what Peter Corn is doing, adding it to the top. I haven't done that yet, but I was integrating river sand into the soil to improve um, heavy clay structures. Um, I haven't been landed with a garden that needed that for some time, and and I've and I've been lucky enough to be able to use only native soils locally, um, which you know I think is the way to go. Yeah, I agree. Okay, uh, here's another. If, specific if I could question. add to that, um, in Olivier has regularly reminded me that um, soils in California are far more rich than in the Mediterranean basin area. Greece mm. and southern France and Spain. <clears throat> yeah. um, they're newer soils. They're they're much. They have more nutrients. Um, we have more um, acidity than we realize. So, mm. based on the plants that grow, that he has observed growing in our area when he's come to visit. So, yeah, he would he he would continue to pound that into my head that you have you know it's a different different premise. So it's really interesting. Yeah. 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 Sean, Not Sean, can I just add to that for a minute? Sean is in Northern California. I'm in Southern California. It's entirely different here. If you go, when I go to Northern California, the plants I see, the soils and all, they are far different. What we have down here in Southern California is probably much more like Greece. Mm. Maybe mm. not quite as extreme, but very alkaline, very little mineral, mm. very, very little nutrition, very little anything. But you see, when I'm planting into native soils like that, it's almost I, I, inevitable that I need to use Olivier's plants because, um, you know, with the exception of a few nurseries, most of the local ones are overfeeding them. Mm -hmm. So if you, you know, you have these plumped up over, 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 over watered and overfed plants going into conditions like that, you can't do it. So yes. I, I, you know, I end up um, using, but it is we are getting more nurseries that are uh, are going in, in the right direction. They just need to go a bit more. I'm guessing in California you have you have good supply of um, nurseries and forward thinking. <laughs> well, when I went to California in 2017 on the occasion of the AGM, I came back and I just went into a three months depression. <laughs> because of the expertise and the level of gardens that we saw and that the plant, the diversity of um, hybridization of plants available um, was just mind blowing. Um, yeah. Mind you, Olivier is going more and more towards species. 
he's 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 decreasing his supply of mm. of um, cultivars which is interesting well um but if you're you know sort of setting or anyway that was just yeah 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 yeah, yeah. they yeah. have good i think that it's a big market right so i mean there's yeah. nicholas is here with us he's working for a big uh nursery um you know it's a huge market so they've got that um extra gear I'm yeah I and mean, I should mention Yanni Grillis you know I think he's the one who's really trying to push the limits the most um some of you may know his nursery out near Marathon um I mean he has some of the range that Olivier has now okay so who's that sorry Yanni Grillis ah uh, yes of course yes yes yeah yeah um a very specific question uh what to do with cypress trees that have grown too tall for the proportions of the garden oh blimey <laughs> <laughs> is that too specific? <laughs> i mean look, look i mean you do you, do you know uh, uh, who was asking that question where are they uh they're in kiosk kiosk yes okay um i don't know if um you Jenny, know, I asked that question. If I can, I Jenny. Where I, yes, hello. I was Fabulous. I, you may remember me. I'd tried working. I asked you to work with us on a project many years ago in Athens. Yes, I remember you. <laughs> Friend of yeah. The um, um, the cypress trees were planted in four different heights. Okay. And although they were watered for the first year for the roots to catch, and since then I haven't watered them. They're about 20, 22 years old, but they've Ooh. grown too tall. And I've lost the proportions, and uh -huh. I was going to lop them like they do in Tuscany. Yeah. Seeing your photographs today in your talk, um, I thought maybe there's another way of doing it. I thought I'd just ask you. Maybe <clears throat> you yeah, I mean, I was going to say, you know, if you if you've seen obviously Tuscan gardens and Nicol de Vessian was a famous one with her garden in La Louvre in the south of France um, when she was making that garden apparently the story goes I don't know if this is true but Louisa Jones um, I think she was the one who told me so it probably is um, that um, she she couldn't afford to buy um, big cypresses and and a nursery um, owner had um, a load of cypresses around the back that had all been had their tops destroyed and she took them all and made a feature of having this garden with top lopped um, cypresses. And they're rather, rather lovely. So, I mean, depending on the, the situation, is, is it in the Hios town? Um, it's just outside Hios town, Rondados. Maybe send me a photograph. I will. There are too many. I, because once you lop the top, you've got to do it every couple of years, haven't you? You it, might have to do that. It depends if the leader grows again. It might not. Yes. The you leader might not grow. Never broken the tips off. Yeah. Yeah, I'd okay. love to see a photo. I hate answering specific questions unless I've seen a photo. Thank you very much. Lo beautiful yeah. talk. Thank you. Thank you, um, too. Uh, there's a question here about using oleanders in Mediterranean gardens, given that you haven't mentioned those. Oh, I didn't mention that. I don't use them very much. Yeah, no, I don't use them much. Occasionally I do when I need a, a flowering shrub in summer. Um, you know, but they do have this toxicity, which puts me off a little bit. Um, and handling them, you know, because we've we, we, sometimes I've inherited gardens which have had huge amounts of oleander, and and you know we have to sh to deal with with um, pruning them and and so on. But I mean, they do they are useful for that sp that summer flowering color on an evergreen, and you it's difficult for us to get it from something else. So I will use them, but not it's not my number one. Um, okay, um, I think I think we should make this the last question because time is yeah. going on. Um, plant suggestions for Paros, no rain for months and it's right by the sea. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that person. That put you on the spot. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, but there's <laughs> loads, <laughs> millions, you know, there's so many and it depends what you, you want. So, I mean, again, we ought to have a dialogue, yeah. um, but, you know, I, I, l l many of those we, we've been, I mean, what, if I give, give out my top 30, most of those would be all right for that situation. I know yeah. Paros, so... Um, you know, I mean, you want to go first for all the stuff that's growing up on the hills, Cistus, Bellotta, Sarcopaterium, um, Saturija, Thrimba, you know, Thyme, uh, all of them, they'll be great. Or you could, or you could hire Jenny to come and, uh, <laughs> and she's, the working, ask, girl. she's the working girl, right? I mean, in the sense of the, <laughs> okay, so. Can I um, ask a quick question? Yes. 
Who's that? Uh, uh, very nice talk, I must say. Uh, if one has a, if one has a already dry garden, but for some reason it's been watered regularly uh, for some time, can you slowly, slowly stop watering those plants? Time scale. I mean, what? How long was it a dry garden, and what? What happened? It was. It was. It was dry garden plants, but it was basically always watered. Oh, blimey. Uh, how, I mean, how frequently D did you have a drying out period in between? Because that's key. If you have watered a garden, but it's not so frequently that the soil remains moist all the time, then you have a much better chance of um, getting them back to dry garden health. Yeah, it was not moist, I must say. But I mean, one, ha one can, I presume you cannot stop it immediately. No, I think you can wean them off, though. I mean, you might want to trim off um, growth that might wilt in the period that they, you know, are struggling to adapt. So to keep the evapotranspiration rates down, you might want to keep trimming. Um, but I would, you know, wean them off slowly, slowly, depending on the frequency of the the watering. You could start by doing a little and a little and a little um, to slowly get them up to, um, a, a, you know, a good a good stage. Okay, thank I you think very it's much. Worth Donald, Donald, I think Donald it's worth Matthews has got his hand up. Um, uh, thank you, Donald. Yes, uh, Jenny, uh, uh, you may remember the garden that I have been uh, very close to Spiral Design. Of course, in, yeah? of course, of course. Of uh, course. Uh, let me come back to the question about um, oleanders because I, they're such a useful plant, I find. They're a very common they piece, of course. And, and I remember and yours. Uh, very, <laughs> good. And you uh, have uh, lots of scented ones. Uh, yes, some of them, yes, are a strong vanilla scent um, and a, a great variety. Not all that Filippi had uh, because he no longer keeps them, I don't think. He no well. longer supplies them, no. So about 60 or 70 varieties we have in the garden here. And you there's might, uh, such wonderful you plants. Might, you might they, be the they're... national collection. Uh, what's that? Sorry. You might be the national collection for Greece. I mean, I don't oh, think we no, have this I, I don't phenomenon know about that. here. But they're such but... wonderful plants. They're disease resistant. They don't need all that much water, and they flower for so long. And they're I a very know a uh, plant, but you don't seem to uh, like to use them. Is it quick to test or they're practical? <laughs> <laughs> I have, there were some oleanders in the last project, especially we've got oleanders because we needed some cool. green, some some color. And so, yeah, I'm a bit mean, but I I I think I am slightly prejudiced because of the the handling of them. But 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 you're right. I mean, I it's a prejudice. You know, I really dislike um disliking plants. Um, so I I I I don't like to have prejudices against them. But I, I it's not my first, my number one. That's but I. But I, I remember them in your your garden, and they're lovely. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? Uh, yes. Hello. Uh, Liz. Hi, Liz. Yeah, just one, one, one quick question. Um, gardening in Greece, I did garden. I use that word loosely in, on Paxos for a time. Um, we used our rainwater. We kept, kept it in a sterner and could use that over over the summer to water how how compulsory is it in say in Corfu because so many people are watering the water tables being affected are oh. they being made to hold their water from the there's plenty of water in the winter can do they hold it oh, yeah we're encouraging it like crazy um it's 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 compulsory if you want to be in be in a position where you um you know, if you're not completely committed to dry garden and you're going to be watering your garden, you need to be ha rain rainwater harvesting without a doubt. Yeah, okay. Without a doubt. Um, and and I should have mentioned it, it was on my notes to mention. So yeah, I mean, um, we strongly encourage it, and and I think it should be it should be compulsory. And they're not doing nearly enough in Corfu, uh, both publicly and privately. But the 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 incentive is actually coming much more from the private side now. Okay. So some of my clients have like storage tanks of 400 cube and if we get into the project early enough um they usually take the advice to do it because you can fill you know some a summer thunderstorm in corfu can half fill a tank of 100 yeah. cube you know so it makes all the difference and it's free um, <laughs> it is free i mean there's so many good things and you know the water many of our villas in corfu get um, have a very um, inconsistent water supply during the summer um, and you know we have this problem with pools we have 
Corfu has too many uh, visitors, really. So there's a there's a huge stress on this island that has all this water, and um, you know the tankard water is, is is not is not a very good quality. So yeah, absolutely crucial. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Liz, Caroline, Norris. Thank you. Um, Jennifer, could you actually include with your list on plants um, some recommendations of gardens to see in Greece that would be good Mediterranean gardens to see? Public gardens. Anything that, Anything. you know, that I could see if I went there or I could recommend uh, that somebody's going yeah. there. Okay, yeah, I, I can. I mean, there's not... Um, I know some... private gardens can be a problem, but... Um, yeah, I mean, Corfu now, you know, Corfu's become a bit of a garden hotspot um, because um, there's been, you know, a lot of a lot of investment into the island and there's a lot of large um, houses with large plots um, and people who are able to, to, to develop quite extensive gardens. And they have a Corfu open, Corfu Gardens oh. open day twice a year. So if you were visiting Greece, it might be a good time to time it with that. And Rosie, well, Rosie, that Rosie, Bowen, Rosie is in with us today. She's in. The is Rosie here? here? Yeah, they organize it. She and Christina, okay. they're, they're the, they they organize the coffee open. So that would be one thing. Um, yeah, I'll think about Let me think about it. I mean, of course, there's Sparosa. That's the main one. Yeah. Um, but there are other possible private gardens that, you know, you might get access to, but it needs organization. I mean, we we do now in Corfu quite a lot of tours. We've had the American Horticulture Society, um, the Portuguese came, the Irish um, Horticulture Society. Yeah, quite a few have been to, and, and Rue is on the tour. And Katerina and I are going to do a, P a Peloponnese tour together, aren't we, Katerina? Oh, fantastic. Mm. One way or the other, it's going to happen. <laughs> so, Katerina, doubtful. Like going that up. Okay, so um, we'll finish. This will be the last question. Joran, hello. There. Um, I haven't got a question. I just want to say thank you to uh, Jennifer Gray because a long time ago you used to write for Athens News. Oh. before he died and, <laughs> yeah. uh, thanks to those uh, columns or the columns you used to have there I became a member of the Mediterranean Gardens Society uh -huh. so I just want to say thank you that was all uh -huh. that's that's lovely to hear yeah no it's a long time now it's been gone over 10 years um but I might try and start writing again soon I've been so busy I haven't had time really but I'm I, I want to there's an excellent time. article in this um, the, this month's um, issue of the Mediterranean Garden, all about plants and planting from you, isn't there? Yes, there is actually. But um, Car that's an old article that Caroline used from many years before. Oh. I don't know. I should have told you all that, but <laughs> you should have said yes, of course. It is. It's very detailed and very long. And I was going to say, well done if you've done that as well as doing your work. Thank no. you so much. <laughs> Um, Jenny, for thank being you too, um, and uh, we'll look forward to getting s those little lists while you know putting you under a bit of stress. Sorry, um, and no. if anybody wants to be in touch with Jenny, um, you know, just I'll, I'll definitely pass on your email unless you want to give out your email now. Um, perhaps I can do. Yeah, I mean the Para uh, question and the North question. I think they they need specific. Um, yes. thought and also the kiosk question um you know i can if you send me photos i would consider that a little bit more um personally well, I'll, I'll definitely get um, those to you then but yeah i mean i can give my email now if you like it, um so it, people would be de delighted to be in touch with you it's medlandscapes at gmail.com so that's short for mediterranean landscapes okay Super. All right. That was brave of you. Of activity. <laughs> Thanks everybody for joining in. It's great to see uh, you all again. And um did indeed. I'll see you next month. Okay. okay. Thank, you, so much, Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you for participating. Thank you, Jennifer.
Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, Angela. Thank you very much. You're welcome, always. Okay. Thanks to both of you. Bye.